Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this week, because it's Halloween week, we are going to be sharing our spooky, spine chilling seasonal reads. And as we share the titles, they will appear on your screen along with the different formats that they are available in through the Monroe County Library System. If you want to get your hands on any of these titles, the quickest way to do that is probably to call your local branch of the Monroe County Library System and speak to one of the librarians. If you'd like to do it on your own, you can always get onto our online catalog. The web address for that is there on your screen. This will give you access to physical copies of the titles, hardcovers, paperbacks, audiobooks on CD, large print. Or if you'd like a digital version, some of the titles are available on one of our two provided platforms. The first is Overdrive which you may also hear referred to as Libby. The name of the app is Libby. They're the same thing. And Overdrive provides downloadable ebooks and downloadable audiobooks. And then we also have Hoopla, which provides downloadable ebooks, audiobooks, and also movies, music, and graphic novels. And the great thing about Hoopla is if you see it on there, you can download it immediately. There is never a wait for any of the items that you see on Hoopla. And with us this week is, of course, myself. I'm Jennifer Grineski. I'm the community librarian at the Dundee Branch Library. And this week, because it's Halloween, our introductory question is, what is your favorite Halloween, or if you're not a Halloween-y person, fall or autumn tradition? And for me, it is definitely trick-or-treating. I grew up in a subdivision and we went trick-or-treating and ye olden days when you just went out with your pillowcase and there wasn't a set time and as soon as it was dusk you could run around and start hitting up your neighbors and when you came home whenever your grown-ups decided it was time for you to be home so it, and my dad loved halloween so he liked going out trick-or-treating with us and then once my son was old enough we started trick-or-treating and we trick-or-treat in rain shine, snow, hail. We do it in all of it. And I remember two years ago, it was pouring rain and windy. And there was a side street that we were like, there's a house with a light on at the end. So we literally have our umbrellas like this facing into the rain and wind to keep them from blowing black back at us. And we got down to that house and that man had good candy. So it was worth it. But I, I just, I love, getting in costumes and I love helping my son find his costume every year. So I love trick-or-treating. He's 12 this year and we have decided no trick-or-treating this year. So that's real hard for me, you know, but uh, you know, we got good memories. So I love trick-or-treating. Also with us this week, we have Kelly Venier, the branch technician at the South Rockwood Branch Library. And what is your favorite fall or Halloween tradition, Kelly? So mine's definitely trick-or-treating as well. My mom um, has a big family, and for as long as I can remember, we've always gone over to my grandmother's house. Uh, she lives in the subdivision, and, um, you know, it was the pillow pillowcase hardcore. My dad is really competitive and into it, so he would be the one that would take us out, and it would be like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Like, there was no holding back. And so he's kind of taken the reins with uh, my kids, too, because they're a little bit older than my sister's kids. So... You know, we have the group that stays back with the little ones. And then my dad, who is like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, so it's a little bit sad that this year things are going to be a little bit different. Luckily, we have enough people in the family that we're doing a trunk or treat so the kids won't lose out. Um, so that, that's good. But um, I also um, love the Halloween movies that you, you know, I'm one of those moms that like, if it's not Christmas, you can't watch Christmas movies. If it's not Halloween, you can't watch Halloween movies. So like Hocus Pocus, Sleepy Hollow, um, George, Curious George, spectacular Halloween, you know, um, I look forward Brown. to all those movies. Yep, Charlie Brown. <laughs> so that's another, another one that I look forward to. Nice. I feel like your dad and I would be on the same page with the trick-or-treating. He's in uh, so, like, just to check, if it's raining or there's inclement weather, it's cheating to have your car follow your Oh, kid. absolutely, you, absolutely. You, you get out there. It. If it's raining, you just walk through you that rain or that snow. Like I don't have follow him in the car. No. I have one kid who's like go go go, and then one who's like, 
Do I got enough? Good. <laughs> I'm done. Oh, fun. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> also with us this week, we have Jen McCarty, who is a reference librarian at the Ellis Branch. And what is your favorite Halloween tradition, Jen? I think um, one of my favorite things is something fairly new for us. Um, so my brother lives on a dead end dirt road. So, you know, they don't, their neighborhood isn't really trick or treatable. So when we bought the house that we're currently in, it's a great neighborhood. Um, they started coming here. So even when my kids were super little, so now the boys are older and they still, my nephews are teenagers and still have no problem trick or treating. So <laughs> even this year where things are a little bit weird, we're still going to get together. They're still going to come over. Usually what we do is we just order like pizza, we eat, we you know have a good time, we have some cider, then we all go out. But before we go out every year since we have lived in this house, so based about six years since my littlest one was just first born, we've taken a picture of all the kids on our stairs. And I love it because it's so cute to see them grow. You know, like my nephew when we started was like 11 and now he's an adult. <laughs> And you know, seeing my kids grow, like my 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 youngest's first Halloween, he was a baby. So like one of the kids is you know holding his little Jack Skellington, and now he's you know a six year old who thinks he's in charge of all the things. So I just love that little tradition that we've started, and I don't care as long as they come over. If they are in college, they're still taking a picture on my stairs, and they're gonna like it. <laughs> but it just it just makes me happy to see that that growth and how excited they are to you know be doing this thing with their family and their cousins and. It's so fun. Thank you, Jen. And also with us this week, we have Sarah Willarius, who is a sub throughout the system and has worked in almost every branch in the Monroe County Library System. And what is one of your favorite Halloween traditions, Sarah? Mine has got to be uh, the costumes. My dad would dress up with us and wear like the scariest, freakiest costumes. Now, my dad back then, not now, but he was a uh, pretty tall and pretty muscular. So he would pick like this witch that had like this green hair and you, you know, the, the plastic mask you can't breathe out of, you know, you're sweating on the inside. He would hide behind the trees and pop out and <laughs> yeah, he would be carrying extra pillowcases and swap them out. And then we'd stop at home, <laughs> dump the candy at mom's, go back out. Yeah. So I have carried that on where we have like family themed costumes, but this year we were going to go Christmas because I think Christmas is great anytime and they're already playing <laughs> Christmas music, so let's get happy, but I get it. But I just thought it'd be fun. You know, it's cold where we're at. So my husband has this huge Grinch costume, COVID hit. I quit looking because I didn't think we were gonna go this year. So we're all Mitch matched this year. My husband is going to be um, Michael Myers from Halloween, which I absolutely hate. Yeah, on our table is the mask <laughs> on a paper towel. So when you come up to our door, like he's looking at you. Nice. I, I tried to get Autumn to be a jellyfish this year. because I'm like, what can I throw together since we're not going to be technically a theme? She wants to go as a person standing in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. With the little thing coming yeah, over. And on the boom down. hoop and the shower curtain. Oh, yeah. She, she nice. saw it on Pinterest. Gotta love Pinterest, right? <laughs> so I'm going to start trying, trying to get it. So because of my dad's character and everything, wedding, he literally walked down the aisle in um, a top hat and a cane. So I am going to go as Willy Wonka from Tim Burton's. Hopefully it's cold because I have like a red wool like dress pea coat that comes together and I'm like, just put all black underneath. I went and got like the sunglasses today and I was like, so we're going to be dressed up, but not like in a theme. They're going to be looking at us. Yeah. Like, do they belong together? Do they not? <laughs> but Halloween is all about good times. Thanks, Sarah. And I like your buddy there with you this oh, week. Oh, yes. His, his name is Sheldon. Oh, hey, Sheldon. Autumn named him <laughs> nice. after a uh, Big Bang Theory. <laughs> she nice. This is Sheldon. Nice. Well, we're happy to have Sheldon. All right. And we're going to move into our spooky reads. And I think I'm going to let Jen get us kicked off this week with her spooky seasonal reads. All right. So my first one um, is called Anna Dressed in Blood. And it's by Kendar. I don't know if it's Kendari or Kendare or something Blake. It's a K. It's a cool name. 
But um, <laughs> I saw a couple of nods. Kelly's with me on this one, and I know Jennifer read this one as well. This is an amazing book. It's a YA, um, but it's definitely, it's technically a YA, but it definitely feels a little bit maybe older. Um, so it follows Cass Lowell, who has inherited the job of basically being like a ghost hunter, but not like, you know, TV ghost hunters go with their electromagnetic. No, like he literally hunts ghosts. Um, and when the book has started, his dad has died. You know that his father was killed by a menacing spirit and Cass wants to take vengeance on that spirit. So he gets word of this new, um, this spirit that lives in this small town and he convinces his mom to go there. Obviously she's on board with, you know, the ghost hunting thing. He's armed with this um, special knife basically that he inherited from his father that can kill ghosts or send them on to wherever they go next. Um, and there's this, there's this spirit rumored in this town that the town refers to her as Anna dressed in blood. And she's a teenage girl dressed all in white and anybody who supposedly sees her or comes in contact with her has been brutally murdered. Yikes. Um, so Cass, of course, wants to see the spirit and he gets some local people to take him to the house and things go real, real south. But Cass gets away. Cass is the first person ever to survive Anna and it seems like she didn't just let him get away she purposefully did not hurt him and he's like what's going on here so that's kind of the mystery of the story you have this it's very like gothic feeling it's very dark but it's very beautifully written and you have this sort of this really menacing awful ghost but is she like, why is she a ghost? Why is she trapped here? Why is she murdering people? Um, and Cass wants to get to the, you know, get to the center of this. And it's just, this book is so, it's weird to say kind of a scary story is beautiful, but it is. It's so well written. Um, it's just, I don't want to give like too much away of the story, but it's absolutely just an awesome, awesome read. And if you like ghost stories, if you like kind of spooky stories, I cannot recommend this one enough. I love this book. Um, there is a follow-up. It's called Girl of Nightmares, I believe. Yeah, yes, that sounds right. It's just the two books, so it's not like, you know, a giant series that you're getting yourself into, but so good. So, so, so good. Um, my second book, I'm going to go classic for my second book, Dracula by Bram Stoker. Um, and I, I really debated on what to do for my second book, but I think Dracula is just like, it's one of the original gothic horror novels. Really, like, we owe so much to the genre of horror and spooky reads in general. Two books like Dracula and Frankenstein. Um, so, you know, you got to give a little props to, to the masters. So if you have not read Dracula or you're not familiar with the story, the main character is Jonathan Harkness. And he's your average kind of, you know, Londoner. He's got a fiance named Mina and she's great and he gets this job where he's going to go to Transylvania to meet with Count Dracula to pretty much facilitate Dracula moving to London. He's going to help him with some real estate and whatnot. And he gets to the castle. All of the villagers are like, you don't want to go there. Don't do not go there. And he's like, eh, I got too much up. Of course, he gets there and things are weird. Um, he realizes that this is not what he, you know, not what you're used to. He leaves, catches up with his, with his fiance, who is whose friend has fallen ill. And basically, it's just all intertwined. These stories, there's also um, Van Helsing, who has become a very you know popular character in pop culture. And, you know, today basically is synonymous for a va vampire hunter. And this is where it starts. It starts with Dracula. Um, the, I love this story because it's a little bit spooky. It's a little bit creepy. It's you know, it, it's maybe not as shocking today as it was then, but you can definitely see how much of our current stuff we owe to this one book. I mean, Dracula is synonymous with vampires. Um, Van Helsing has become kind of synonymous with like vampire monster hunters. Renfield, if you read any, um, if you read any regular supernatural books, that comes from there. Renfield is basically like a vampire like human minion more or less that started with this book so there's so much that we owe today to Bram Stoker's Dracula and I just think that's a great 
you know, seasonal read to go back to because you can really see like how far some, you know, those genres have come. You know, now our vampires range from super, super spooky to sparkly. And that's a great thing to have that range. And we owe a lot of it to Dracula. So true. And just to piggyback off of that, um, there are some good vampire novels out there. And one of them is Let the Right One In by John Lindfist. I didn't get to talk about it this week. I was going to, had my slide already. <laughs> and the library system doesn't have a copy of it anymore. So, you know, if you're out there and you want it, you can get it through the statewide system, but I didn't put it in. But yeah. Let the Right One In is just such a strong tie into those original vampire Dracula novels. Well, uh, I just think there's so much, and I love Let the Right One In. Uh, for modern vampire tales, it's creepy and spooky, but there's also a lot of relationship and thoughtfulness that goes into the relationship between the two young main characters. Um, it's it's so good, and I think the book's better than both versions of the movie. There's an American version, and then there's a foreign language version, which I want to say is like Swedish or Norwegian, but I don't remember exactly which one. That's um, when I was debating like what books to pick. I I realized I read. I read primarily fantasy, fantasy, like supernatural stuff. That's kind of my genre. But I didn't really think any of them were like necessarily spooky. Um, but it's kind of funny looking at like looking at my list on Goodreads, like of what I've read. How many things that I love that really owe so much to books like Dracula and Frankenstein, because like that started it. You yeah. know, that started this this crazy genre really of this sort of gothic horror and. So many books that I love that maybe aren't really spooky, but they're supernatural, wouldn't exist. Yep. So thank you, Jen. Taking us back to a classic. Classic. And let's have Sarah share her spooky reads next. I never started out reading spooky reads. My mom read true crime growing up. So those like paperbacks of like the real pictures were always laying around. So I didn't start reading these until I started working at the library because I feel like, okay, now I'm like selling books. You know, not everyone wants to read Debbie May Cumber, Nora Roberts, fluff books. And then when you're processing the books and you're seeing what's like being on hold and you're like, I just put 30 of these books on hold for people, <laughs> I probably should read them. So definitely my first one is The Guest List. That is one that is um, on hold for everybody, and it is amazing. My mom is reading it right now, and she can't put it down. But I think it got its fame. Reith Witherspoon did it as her uh, book club. But I saw it, again, I was reading, processing new books, and I was like, oh, this book is going to be great. So it's on an island that used to be haunted, or everyone thought it was haunted, so there's a brother and a sister who have bought the island and they're training it and changing it into like the hottest wedding venue. So they pick this upcoming star and his bride to be who is a publicist and they're giving them a free wedding for publicity. He'll talk about it on his show. She'll put right about it in her magazines. Well, you have to take a ferry to get over there. It's the only way you can get to the island. So once you're there, you're kind of stuck. Once they get there at the rehearsal dinner, you know, everyone is like, man, don't the people who own the wedding, you know, do they look familiar? Like you're, they're staying in this, they didn't renovate and make anything modern in the hotel. So like there's trap doors and there's like back backwards stairways and there's all these cool hiding places. So, and then like people will show up and then they'll disappear. Well, yeah, that's pretty much, I don't want to give any more away, but you just, you just got to read it because the ending is another one where you're like, oh, okay, wow, hmm, but yeah, there's some blood and guts in this one, and yeah, there's somebody dies, and you're like, how did that happen? Why, she, mm, wow, mm-hmm. This one reminds me a lot of, um, a slightly more violent Agatha Christie. That's what I will because they're in a closed environment. Mm -hmm. So you know it's not like some creeper coming onto the island. And then they keep dying. <laughs> you know, like 
All right, we get, we're narrowing down our suspects here, and they've all got secrets in their past, yes. you know, that you're like, ooh, and they're always juicy secrets. I, I really enjoyed this one. It's a it's a page turner. So but I, I'm telling you, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer, because that's what this <laughs> book is, because you're like, I didn't see it at the coming at the end, that you're like, wait, what? She <laughs> was who? <laughs> wow, yup, say you're sorry and be nice. <laughs> <laughs> So like I, I I have read so many of these. I don't like haunted houses or scary movies, but apparently I like to read the thrillers, the scary books. I like to be up at night reading <laughs> these. So my next one is The Perfect Mother. And this one is a girl in Ireland and she's young and pregnant and didn't have a great upbringing. And she just doesn't want to raise the baby by herself. So she goes on the internet and does like a private adoption and finds this perfect A-list couple here in the United States to adopt her baby. Well, they're gonna fly her over. She's gonna live with them. They're gonna pay all her medical bills, take her to all appointments. She'll have a car. She'll be able to use all the services that they have. She just cannot say that she's the surrogate and giving the baby over. Well, her best friend is like, no, I, that sounds too weird. Like that's, that's all. That's a sickening movie. You're going to come up, die at the end. Like, don't go. Like, stay here. We'll help you raise the baby. And she's like, no. And so they keep going back to who the father is. And she's like, I'm not going to tell you. We're just going to give the baby up. So she comes over here to the to the United States. And it's not at all what this uh, powerful couple said it would be. The wife is a little crazy. <laughs> so when she gets here, uh, well, before she comes, her best friend tells her, okay, we have to come up with a code word because if you text me anything crazy, like my, her dad, the, her best friend's dad is a detective, we'll come over and we'll get you. But she was like, no, no, it's fine. People do this all the time. But no, she ends up texting Pickle and uh, yeah, when she comes over, she realizes that this house is a house of horrors and I might not make it out alive. Do they want me or they do they just want the baby? Yeah, it was trust your crazy. gut, people. Trust, trust your gut. Your gut. <laughs> Don't go wandering off into other countries based on promises of of luxury. But it yeah. really got me thinking. You know, the stars use a lot of surrogates. I'm sure this is based loosely on some stars who have found like, because you know, they say we all have our own Doppler ganger out there. So. Hey, maybe I can find a baby that looks like Autumn and just pay thousands of dollars. You know, you never know. Nice, nice. And then on that note, <laughs> <laughs> again, there's no good segues from these, you know, <laughs> these strange thriller novels. <laughs> so um, I'm going to let Kelly share her spooky reads. But that one does sound like a book that I would read, Sarah, because the weirder, the better for me. I like yes. the Ones. And it does. It takes all these twists and turns and weird things and the girl ends up figuring it out and she calls the wife out and it just makes her the wife more psycho. And then you're like, oh, the husband's in on it too? Holy <laughs> cow, girl, run. <laughs> run. Run for the exit. Don't run upstairs. Run for the exit. <laughs> Remember that. Words to live by. All right, Kelly, what are your spooky reads? So... Um, you know, I like YA and J books, um, so I tried to um, stick to that, um, what I know. So I'll get started with the first one is The Haunted. And this book we read for our Not So Young Adult Book Club this month. Um, actually, we're meeting on Monday to talk about it, and I'm kind of excited about it. So um, this one I picked for the book club based on its reviews. Um, actually, the second one just got released, and the reviews for the second one was super good. And they said, you have to read the first one because that's amazing. So we did the first one and it's called The Haunted by Daniel Vega. Um, so this, the main character, um, I always do this. I always read the books and then I forget their names. Hendrix is her name. <laughs> um, her and her family, um, they move from Pennsylvania um, to a small town um, and everyone knows everyone and they move into this house that um, everyone in the community knows as the Steel House and some crazy things have been going on. but. Um, you know, it's a fresh, it's a clean slate for her. Um, right away, the reader knows that Hendrix and her family have moved because something has happened to Hendrix in her past with her ex-boyfriend. No one really knows what that is. Um, 
And as the story starts unfolding, she makes new friends um, and that the story starts coming out what happened in this house. Um, so there was a little girl who um, was murdered in the house five years prior and her brother, her older brother, was found laying over her body apologizing. And so they um, they tried him and he got convicted of murdering her and then he committed suicide in the house. Um, her parents are real estate agents and they're trying to fix up the house. They fell in love with it and decide that's why they're going to stay there. Well, while they're there and they're staying the night, weird things start happening. She starts hearing voices. Um, she starts hearing footsteps upstairs. She goes down to the cellar and a ghost cat comes at her. And then all of a sudden she smells her ex-boyfriend's cologne. And then this, this boy comes out of nowhere and says that he's going to, um, make her pay, um, while the story is unfolding and you're meeting new characters, there's a, um, a neighbor that lives behind the house that she sees outside and he's dressed in all black and kind of um, withdrawn from everyone. And she finds out that this boy, Eddie, her brother, his brother and his sister are the ones who died in the house. And so one night she has a um, situation in the bathroom mirror where she, she is seeing things and um, her parents are telling her it's nothing it's PTSD from what happened this is a clean slate well he um, approaches her and says I heard you screaming did you see something um, and she of course denies it because she thinks that it's just the PTSD from what happened in her in her old town so as the story progresses her and Eddie start getting closer and she reveals to him all the things that she's seeing and he's like I knew it there's there's ghosts there let's do a ritual to try and get rid of them and so they do, and during the ritual, um, it, nothing happens for a couple weeks, but then all of a sudden, they start hearing things again. So they have a, um expert come in, and she says that she, they the ghosts need an offering. Three boys um, went missing in the 70s, and they believe that is who is haunting the house, and that is who is responsible for Eddie's um sister's murder and his brother's murder. So as they're doing this, uh, Hendrix thinks that she's given the final sacrifice and that everything's going to be okay. But two weeks later, they find out that's not the case. And uh, this, the plot totally shifted. And what really happened to these boys and who these boys were and who their murderer was, I was like, what? No. <laughs> so it was really like, because at first I was like, oh, okay, yeah, no, this is pretty, you know, I get it. It's creepy and it's very detailed and gory, which I love. Um, but then when they flipped that switch, I was like, oh, no, uh uh. Um, it ended abruptly too, in order to lead into the sequel, which just came out, which I just got today in delivery. So I know what I'm doing this weekend. <laughs> Um, so if you like, you know, a tale where there's secrets on all all accounts and you want to be um, thrown into the opposite direction, Haunted um, by Daniel Vega is where it needs to be. Um, the second book, awesome. yeah, it was really, really good. Yeah, way better than I actually thought it would be. I mean, the, you always read reviews and they're like, oh, my gosh, it was so good. And then you read it and you're like, that was trash. Um <laughs> I hate reading reviews and, you know, things like that so that I'm not disappointed. But this one I was I was really I was excited about. Um, the second one I'm going to talk about is Doll Bones by Holly Black. And I remember when this one came out um, and I was doing book clubs at the middle school and I was like, oh, yeah, we'll order this one. This one looks good. And then I read it and I was like, oh, that's a little bit creepy for middle schoolers. So this book isn't necessarily spine chilling for grown ups, although kind of because I went into a deep dive and I'll get into that in a second. But um, this is kind of creepy for middle age. So if you, you know, if you're looking for a story for a reluctant reader, this is a good hook. So um, it's based on three friends, Alice, Stack, and Poppy. They're all 12 years old. And they have been playing um, and making up games for as long as they can remember. Zach has his G.I. Joe. Um, and they have all these different characters that they play with um, after school. And um, Poppy, her mother, has this very rare bone china doll in a um, china cabinet. And they're not allowed to take her out. They're not allowed to touch her. But she's just very creepy and eerie. And she has, like, a watchful eye over the kids as they play this game. So they make her part of their game, and they call her the queen. So she sits up in her castle in the, in the cabinet, but you can't touch her. She's always watching. Well, Zach's dad 
Um, him and his mom were separated. His dad moves back into the house and his dad decides that he is way too old to be playing with toys. So he throws out all of Zach's toys and he's like, you're done. Like, this is it. So Zach is extremely embarrassed. He's upset because these games and these friendships mean so much to him. So he tells his friends that he's done. Like, I, I don't want to play anymore. And this is that. And Poppy and Al Alice are devastated. So Poppy comes to his house in the middle of the night and says that the queen, this doll, came to her in her dreams and she um, got murdered and her bones were made or her, her, the ashes of her bones were made into this doll figurine and the rest of her remains are inside the doll and the hair from the doll is her hair. She comes to Poppy in the dream and says that her dad was so distraught by her death he worked at a pottery, um, a pottery factory that he took her bones, like dismembered her, put her in the kiln, made the bone ash, and then made this doll for her so she could continue living. Well, she's unrestful and she wants to be buried into her grave. So Poppy's like, this is our last quest. We have to go. So in the middle of the night, they catch a bus and they try to go to East Livernoy, Ohio, which is about a three hour drive from where they are in Pennsylvania to try and bury this doll. Well, weird things start happening. Um, like they go to a restaurant and the waitress says, oh, oh, table for four. And they're like, well, no, there's only three of us. And all these people keep making um, assumptions and saying four, four, or it's the girl with the blonde hair and every, and they're like, we don't get it. And they just th keep thinking like, oh, it's a mistake. Until one night they sneak into a library to um, fall to get some rest. And the pink haired librarian runs into them and she makes them call their parents because, you know, that's responsible. And um, so he, they can't find the doll. The doll's gone missing. Also during this sidebar, the doll is starting to come to Zach in his dreams as well. So he knows that this is not a fake thing that Poppy's trying to do with them together. It's a real thing. So when he's looking for this doll, he finds the story of this girl um, and her dad, and the dad was actually tried for her murder and um, killed himself in jail. And I was like, whoa, that's kind of dark for a middle school book. So um, they have to go and finish this quest so that they can put her put her to rest. But um, yeah, it's super creepy, but also not like, it's not overly gory, but just the, the premise of it, um, it, it's good to hook readers. So here's my deep dive. So I've always heard of Bone China, right? But then I was like, well, is this like a thing? Like, I mean, do people really take like humane or human remains and like make them into ash? So bone china was um, kind of played with in England in the early 1800s, late 1700s. They took cattle bone and they made it into ash. And there's different um, fractions that make make the kind of pottery that they use. But it's actually very strong, even though it looks very translucent lucent and, and um, frail. The bone ash makes it actually stronger. Um, so I'm reading into this. It's all very fascinating. Then I come across these articles of these pottery artists who actually have been taking human remains and making them into pottery as some kind of art. Specifically, there's a 28 year old, well, he was 28 in 2016, who um, came up with a specific um, collection of bowls and um, cups and plates. He took, he bought bones from a bone dealer, because that's the thing. And he got 200 human bones, made, like, round them up and put them into the glaze of his pottery, and then had a creepy dinner party with all of his friends and said, hey, guess what you're eating on? Human remains. Um, he even catered the meal to look like human flesh. Like, he picked pork because that's what's close. Yeah. So it's all very fascinating. And they all argue this is the best way to be preserved or how to preserve a loved one because they're not rotting in the ground. They're not in the ugly urn. They're in like a beautiful piece of pottery. So this gentleman, Justin Crow, created his own crematory, crematory business where you can send the remains of your loved ones and he will put it in a ceramic pottery bone china, you know. Good see, I can you. kind of see having someone you love, their remains turned into a piece of art. Like, sort of creepy, but I could see that. Sure. I don't want to eat out of it. Like, that's a, li that's a little too far for me. But I could kind of see, like, here's a beautiful, you know, whatever that they turned it into. Yeah, 
it, it was all but but weird. I didn't I guess I never really thought I always thought the bone china was just like a reference to like how white it was and how delicate it was I never really thought that oh it's because you know there's actually bone mashed yeah. up into it <laughs> so um Thomas Fry he was the owner of Bow Porcelain Factory in East London he used to use cow and oxen bones from the nearby cattle makers and butchery shop and that's how it first started the playing with it and then I would have thought like Oh, you know, bone china, like you said, it's translucent. It should be very fragile. It's actually very durable. And there's a difference. There's old bone china and there's new bone china. And the new bone china doesn't use actual bone ash. Um, so you have to kind of be careful with that because that's not as sturdy or, you know, resilient as the bone china. But yeah, I always thought it was just a saying like, oh, that's just a type of china, bone china. But yeah, I did this deep dive. I was I was on this for like two hours yesterday looking this stuff up. I was like, what? And then I got to the artist and I was like, this is this is too much. So Justin Crow's business, I'm gonna do a shout out, is Chronicle Cremation Designs. If anyone is interested in that, you go ahead and do a little Google search and you'll you can send your remains, send your, your loved ones' remains and uh all of that's a little bit little horrifying. Something. And that that yeah. book sounds like my nightmares. Like right. you're like, oh, it's fiddle readers. No. <laughs> Hi, cat. Um, like dolls. Dolls are the creepiest thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. that's that's horrifying. I what? really wanted to, to Wait, bring in this. Yeah, sorry. There's, Kelly. There's, no, it's okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was reading this, my grandmother, when she passed away, she had this really creepy porcelain doll, and like the arms, you know, like it has the cotton body, but like the porcelain arms and. And I have it and I keep it out, which freaks my kids out um, because she is so creepy. Um, but it's packed up in the box, you know, or I totally would have brought it and like, you know, set it next to the haunted house where you guys could see her because she's a creep. But I don't know. I'll have to maybe Rats. next time. Next time. I remember I had those dolls too and I wouldn't go stay at her house. Mm -mm. And she had more than one in glass cases. And I was like, oh no, them dolls are going to come to life as soon as I go to bed. I know that. Right. Someone yeah. bought me when I was a kid a porcelain clown doll. Oh, those are even worse. That's, even better. Right. It that's was right. terrifying. I can remember like being in my room, like it, go, trying to go to sleep and being like, please don't kill me tonight, porcelain clown. <laughs> Well, Did like it was surprised and then you I opened it, it was a little closer. Oh, oh. <laughs> so it was a liberating day when I realized I don't have to keep this in my bedroom just because it was a present. I can like throw it away. <laughs> oh, Get the heck well, out. Then come back and haunt you. The spirit yeah. of the doll will find you. That's mm -hmm. You got me thinking about that guy. Could you like, like, I was like, oh, another thing for Autumn to ask, like when she's on a date, like, could you imagine being on a first date with him? Ask him, like, what are you doing? What do you do? Like, oh, I ground up like human bones. Bones to make art. Like, well, I just finished this project. It's very interesting. <laughs> and yeah. then the whole bone dealer, I was like, that's a, like, he originally yeah, like, put ads on Craigslist. And then, um, at, like, he got a lot of com legal. like comments. I don't know. So there's a bone dealer and they take like um, remains from like medical universities and, okay, or, you know, like stuff like that. And then, um, or they'll sell them to med, like they'll get a um, human remains from like a morgue or something like a John Doe or whatever. And then he takes them and sells them or yeah. So like he just gets these Ooh. 200 bone fragments that nobody wants and grounds them up and puts them in his glaze. Now he does it a little bit differently. He doesn't add it to his pottery mix. He adds it to his glaze. Oh, even so better. That's a little just bit right different. on top. Just yeah. right on top there. I mean, yeah. there are worse things that could be done with your bones, you know, like at least now you're a piece of art <laughs> somewhere. And then you yeah, can be like, be hey, a crazy bone. <laughs> 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 My favorite no, coffee cup you. is a pottery cup. No, I'm like, <laughs> there you go. Freaking bones yeah. every Have a tea time. set made of meat. It's it's truly a cup of Joe. Yes. <laughs> that okay. was really bad. That was bad, but awesome. <laughs> So again, there's no good segue from this. <laughs> so, you know, thanks, Other than, Kelly. Uh, we all want to read Miss <laughs> Kelly's books now. That's right. <laughs> so my books are both centered, for whatever reason, on demon possession. So wow. there you go. The first one is My Best Friend's Exorcism by Grady Hendricks. And it is set in the awesome 80s. 
And Abby and Gretchen have been best friends since fifth grade. They do everything together, and now they're in their sophomore year of high school. And I got to make sure which one's the one. Gretchen begins acting different. And at first, it just seems like she's just a little sad. Maybe she's depressed. And then she starts moving into acts that are horrifying and disturbing. And nobody seems quite sure what's happening to Gretchen. And in the midst of this, it's also the 80s. And for those of us that were teens in the late 80s, early 90s, you are also dealing with the satanic panic. And that's hitting the news and Geraldo's out there doing all these stories about ritual abuse. And there were, you know, VHS tapes that you could watch and might show up at, you know, if you attended church, you probably had to watch a VHS tape about being real careful about what you do and who you talk to and what's really going on behind the scenes. Um, and all of those stories have since been debunked. Um, there were um, daycare centers and all of their workers were accused of horrifying ritual abuse against children. And all of that has been debunked. But that is all happening in the background of this novel. And Abby just wants to help her friend. And there is ultimately an exorcism the ending itself, and I know people hate this, but the ending itself is a little bit ambiguous as to what Gretchen was actually experiencing throughout the novel, whether it was a mental illness, whether there was something else going on, whether it was a possession. But I'm OK with that because the awesome thing about this particular book is that the best part of it isn't the horrifying moments. It's the friendship between Abby and Gretchen. And so I say in my review that I wrote back then that ultimately the title is a little bit misleading because the book is really more about the friendship between Abby and Gretchen than it is about the exorcism. There's also a lot of humor in here. If you live through the 80s and a lot of the 80s culture, there's a lot of humor in there. There are horrifying parts. There's great central friendship. Um, if you want some horror along with a coming of age story, this one's worth picking up. So that's my best friend's exorcism. And then Paul Tremblay's A Head Full of Ghosts starts with a really terrible idea. So Meredith is an eight-year-old and her older sister, uh, Margot, is 14 and starts exhibiting signs of what most people would say is probably some sort of schizophrenia. Um, and their parents decide that the best decision to make for this situation is to put their family on a reality TV show and see what happens. You know, see what happens whether their 14 year old is possibly possessed by a demon. So they're on this reality TV show. Part of the reason they do it, and he does refer to this, is that they are in desperate need of money and they also want to get her some real help. And they're hoping that by doing this show, they'll get enough funds that they can get her somewhere to get her help. So there is some reason behind what the parents are doing. They put her on the TV show. It doesn't go well. In fact, the whole t thing turns into an urban legend about what happened to Margot. And then we meet up with Meredith, the younger sister, 10 years later, who has weird memories of the time was eight when it happened, and you can imagine how traumatic that would be, um, being on TV, having your sister struggling with all of these issues. Um, she's still angry with her parents about all of this, and now she is trying to go back and find out what really happened during those few weeks when they were being filmed. Um, again, it's a really good exploration. It's both horrifying, and it has two things that suck me in, one horror, and to reality TV, because I'm a sucker for anything that's set on reality TV. I don't know why I have a problem. But um, and then and it and it's really exploring, I think, the dynamics of family and what a family, what happens to a family when they are put under extreme stress and pressure. Um, so it, it was a creepy read. It's one of Tremblay's better ones. In fact, I think it was the first one I read by him. He just released Survivor Song, um, which is a pretty good page turner. 
if not one that I felt had a whole lot of depth to it. Uh, Survivor song is there's a pandemic. Good times, but in this pandemic, people are turning into sort of zombie like creatures because, you know, of course, zombies and pandemics go together. And one woman is a doctor, her best friend is pregnant, her best friend gets bitten by somebody who's infected, and before she turns into a zombie, they're trying to get her to the hospital to see if they can get her help, and the whole story takes place over one night, so it's about six hours. So I'll just throw that one out there to Survivor Song. Paul Tremblay's done a lot of horror, some of them really strange, and some of them more straightforward, like Survivor Song and Head Full of Ghosts. So those are my spooky reads. Um, I love spooky reads. This is this is my favorite thing ever. I could have talked for hours on spooky reads. And I loved yep, hearing yep. about all of yours. And of all of them that you chose, the only one I haven't read was Sarah's about the surrogate. So I've got that one added to my list for my spooky read. Um, so thank you to each of you for participating. Oh, there's another one in that? Uh, not there, but along the same like lines, it's called Woman on the Edge. That was another one I was going to try and do. She is at the New York subway and someone gives her a puppy and says, protect her, keep her safe. And then she jumps and that's see now that is a hook that's going to get you right into the novel going. What's going on? Right. So thank you, Sarah. I have not read that one either. There's another so, one. <laughs> thank you to each of you for sharing your spooky reads. For those of you that are listening, we hope that you have a wonderful, fabulous, spooky filled Halloween. And next time we are going to be talking about books that we did judge by the cover and that we picked up and read solely because we liked the cover. So that'll be next time and we hope you have great weeks. Happy Halloween. Bye. Bye.